one realizes that um, not only were we a slave because we were in a miners' home, but also because uh, my father and brothers were miners, but that they also were slaves. And we were slaves because they were slaves to the mine owners. A song that uh, sticks out in my mind is a song that my father and my brothers and men used to sing in that 1926 strike. I was only a, a child, 10 year old, but I still remember it. It was gone now the days when we used to draw our pay. Gone now the days when the work we had a say. Now all is gone and our money is getting low. That's all we the bosses shouting, fill more coal. We'll pay you, we'll pay you when your heads are bending low. We'll build a bigger workhouse for you, but fill more coal. I can always remember my father coming home from work of afternoon shift, putting his pay on the table and saying, there you are, Mark, two pound twelve. There you are, Mark, that's the last you'll get for a while. We got poorer and poorer because my mother only had this ten shillings food note to keep us, which she put in a shop across the road, you know. And uh, also, we used to have a bit of tick, say ten shillings worth of tick per week. You used to have the sacks from the grocery shop, which used to sell potatoes out of. And used to take the bags up the tip, fill it with coal, and bring it down. Sometimes he'd sell a bag for 18 pence, and the rest we used to use ourselves. My mum, I'd work in the, canti in the canteen with the soup kitchens, and she used to come home with a penny doubled up, you know, white penny doubled up, and all the potatoes was, that was over from the soup kitchens, she'd bring them home, you see, to feed us, and also a bone for our little dog. I heard all this noise and singing and whistling and what have you of gazoots. And when I got on top of the hill, I could see this, all these coloured jazz bands coming towards me, all in their black and white uniforms and all these sounds. And I've got a gazoot here, if you'd like me. This is, this is the, one of the actual gazoots which were played in the 1926 and 1921 strikes of the Ronde. And some of these they made themselves. And this is the type of sound it made. Yes, everybody seemed to be very happy, owing to the uh, jazz bands. Very happy. And we had the weather to go with it. And beautiful weather during the strikes. But I never followed the jazz band up. When my husband, well, I had the children to look after. Couldn't afford to go. Well, my father and brothers, of course, would go out to strike meetings, go out walking up and down the valley, go into the clubs and have their chat and probably a drink if they could afford it. Whereas, of course, it was a mother in the home who had the biggest problem. A miner's wife, particularly, I, I'm talking about the Ronda now because they are the ones I know. Because I can remember with an earlier strike, um, my brothers ended up the strike very, very sunburnt, where my mother was worn out. I was born May the 25th, 1894. 
my grandmother wanted me to go in for sewing. But in those days, you had to pay for your apprenticeship. And she couldn't really afford it. So I didn't go in for it. We never had no money from anywhere. We, my husband kept an uh, allotment. And I had chickens. Eggs for the, from the chickens. And that's all we had. Going to the soup kitchens. I had to pay the debt I'd gone into, which was taking the money then out of my husband's pay packet, leaving me with not much money. There was no family allowances in those days. It was hard going when I had seven children at that time, sewing and mending, mending shoes and boots and that for them. I couldn't give them all the facilities they wanted. But I was doing my best for them. Monday was washing day. If I dried, Tuesday was ironing. Wednesday, clean the bedrooms. Thursday, do up there. Friday, down here. Saturday, shopping. That was my five days. Sunday then was rest day. <laughs> Some rest day. My sons worked in the colliery. I had one killed when he was 18 years of age. Well, when my son and my husband were working in the colliery over here, one was working in one pit, the other in the other pit. My son was a bit late coming home, and I was worrying about him. So the old gent next door shouted across to me and said, Mrs. Davies said, there's been a very bad accident in the Gatley colliery. So I said, oh, I hope I said Alfie's all right anyway. Well, usually they send another collier to let you know, but they never sent to tell me anything. I had to wait until my husband come home. I'm a what a miner's daughter, and uh, brought up in a typical Ronda miner's home, where I had my father and three brothers who worked in the pit whilst I had another younger brother who never went into the pits. And this was something that um, we all as a family felt that although the older brothers had worked in a pit, we were not going to allow the youngest member of the family to go. And then we were three sisters. And, but I happened to be the one that was left at home with my mother after school, after leaving school at 13. I was made to understand from my very early childhood that the woman in a miner's home was a slave to the home. And uh, whilst even today, I feel aware of the fact that uh, this was something that one couldn't uh, take any exception to because uh, when brought up in a home where you saw the father and brothers go out very early morning, knew that they were working down underground all day, uh, one accepted what our, the mother said. You must look after them, you see. We realized when we saw them coming into the house, black and tired, we couldn't possibly envy them going down under. We might have envied them had I had a school teacher for a brother, but not a minor brother. I couldn't envy him. There was nothing to envy, really. Uh, the only thing I would say was um, that uh, after they came home, after they'd had their rest, uh, they were trying to educate themselves and um, I did envy them when I found that uh, I had to sit down and read to them for them to do their learn uh, shorthand typewriting. And I felt then that uh, this was getting a bit much that uh, when I ought to be out with friends, that I had to do it. We prepared for the baths for, for the miners by four uh, miners bathed in two uh, different tubs. And uh, it was the work of the mother and daughter, which was myself, to prepare this water by boiling it on a, on a coal fire. But before the clothes were put into the box, they were examined by the mother and daughter to see whether there were any repairs necessary. Well, now this was a very difficult problem because the trousers was very oily, having come from the pit. And uh, before starting, to sew these patches on, my mother would always tell me to get a, a tablet of soap ready so that uh, we would thread a needle and cotton, put the needle into the lump of soap 
so that it would go through the uh, cloth and the patch of the trousers easier. This was one of the uh, dirty jobs that uh, the mother and daughter had to do uh, in order to keep the miners uh, in a position that they could go to work the next day without tears in their uh, clothes. I came across the 1926 strike then, the general strike. Well, I visited homes then, being a health, health visitor. Well, during that time, the strike was on and there was a, a lot of poverty in the miners' homes. And uh, babies were coming into the world where there were no clothes. Very often I visited a miners' home where um, the mother wasn't able to have anything for dinner. As I say, it was a it was very terrible to see the miners' wives, the anxiety they had, because uh, one must admit that it was on the mother that all these problems were put on her shoulders. She might have a good husband, but at the same time he was not, uh, well, um, he didn't help in the house as, uh, shall we say, today. And uh, therefore, of course, the woman did have the uh, biggest problem of dealing with all these things herself, at the same time going without food in order to give it to her children. I would say that women needed a separate organization because they were separate persons. I would say that in uh, the early days that the cooperative Women's Guild was the outstanding uh, organization in the Rhonda Valley. And I think that this brought women out, because I can remember my own mother telling my brothers, where are you going now, ma'am? Well, I'm going to the guild. I'm not so dull as I used to be, you see. And uh, this was something she felt that um, by going to the co-op guild, that she was a woman in her own rights instead of being my father's wife, you see, and my, our mother. She felt she was somebody other. Well, I think I would have liked to have been a teacher. I think that was always in the back of my mind. I would have liked to have taught in the schools, which was quite a good job in those days, of course. But unhappily for me, I mean, uh, you had to pay for yourself to go to colleges in those days. You had to find the fee, different to today. Well, it couldn't be done. I left school when I was 14, and uh, I decided to go to domestic service. So I went up to England, and uh, Brighton actually, and there I worked for a family of six, eight people. But then unhappily for me, mother went ill and uh, I came home to help out. And then I had to help in the house, of course. And I can well remember when we compare what we have to do today to the, those days. I've seen me many times, I and say about 24 shirts for my brothers, you know. And shirts in those days were hard work. They were starched, starched, real starched shirts. And mother used to inspect every one I did up and look at it on the clothes horse to see there wasn't a crease in them. We were six boys and one girl, and my father and mother. And uh, most of my brothers worked in the collieries. And when one was not working, neither, none of them were working. And that's how it went on. During the last war, I decided to go into armaments. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it, despite the work. Then when the war ended, I started in another factory in the Ronda. And going there, I found that there was no union, so I decided to form the first trade union there. So I was in the, that one factory for 27 years, and uh, we were very, very active. Well, the right to strike is surely the right thing, if you are striking for what you think is right. Our miners were working on very low wages, and uh, they had to make a stand in those days for what they thought were rights. And uh, we had some very hard times in the Ronda, because they had lockouts, nine, ten months, and in the end, unhappily for us, they had to go back. We didn't gain money-wise, 
but I think that there was a loyalty among the loyal, which is here even today. And the people who broke the loyalty are still remembered even today. They've never been accepted into, into the wrongness. We still look on them as the scabs, even today. I mean, speaking for myself, I am that way built. This, this is what I feel, you know, that um, it gave you a sense of independence to earn your money and handle it. And I still feel it today. All through the years I've worked, I've had my own money. I've never been kept by anybody, I believe that way. You feel that you have to have your own mind. You've got this thought inside here. But if you ask me today, I still say I think it's a man's world. Despite all, I still say it's a man's world. Despite women's lib. I should have loved to have been a vet. Wouldn't it have been lovely today now if I had a few letters behind my name? I've got a brother and I've got my sons with letters behind my name. And I think, given the opportunity, my brain is equally so good as it, theirs. I would have had a much fuller life, wouldn't I, today? Just think what I could have done if I had a degree with the letters behind my name. But at 14, I left school. I left school one week. I was up on the train to Surrey the next week. I got fitted out La Poche, you know. It was a packman who used to come through the valleys. My mother used to pay a few shillings a week. I got fitted out with my clothes and my train fare was borrowed. And I went up to this job up in London. I was reasonably happy there. They were good to me. But each month then I used to have two pound pay. And out of that two pound, then I used to have to send the most of it home to pay for my clothes and pay back my train fare. The woman of the house used to say to me sometimes, are you homesick? Because some days I used to be very quiet, you know. I used to say no, but many a night I used to look through the bedroom window and look at the moon, you know, and think of the old valley and home. I did used to want to go come home, but I knew that I had to stick it out, like there was no jobs around here. But they were in the strike. There was a pawnbroker, Danton Pandi, you see. And um, one of the things that went was uh, my mum took her wedding ring down there one week when we was pretty hard up to buy food. She didn't like doing it, but uh, she did take it down. And it was years before she had it back. Each year, my mother used to, used to be helter skelter year in the years. My mother had lost a pawn ticket for her wedding ring. She kept it in different places. We used to have hunting everywhere for the ticket for mum to, to go down, not to, to redeem my ring, to pay on it, to keep it there. And when the strike was over, my dad went back to work and my brothers, but things weren't easy then because there was all this arrears that had to be paid off. You know, there was a, a few shillings a week up to the shop over the road. Well, I think the strikes just made us poorer made us poorer altogether. There was this lovely green valley, you know, these men came here digging coal. What, what, for what, who's benefit? It certainly wasn't for the valleys, because in my opinion, well, we all became poorer, didn't we? You know, they just left the landowners and the mine owners, they just reaped the benefit themselves. Baldwin and Co. have slammed the Russian dough. They've made a mess, and now they're feeling so. They've got the brains, but the wrong end, as you know. That's all you hear the bosses shouting, Phil Mo. Oh.